So I'll be presenting work that I've done at the laboratory of Malcolm McCulloch at the University of Western Australia in collaboration with uh, a number of people there, as well as in collaboration with members of the Center Scientific de Monaco. So as we know, uh, levels of CO2 are rising in the atmosphere, and that CO2 in turn dissolves in uh, surface waters and equilibrates with existing carbonate species. The net result of rising atmospheric CO2 levels is shown here. So we increase CO2, uh, pH declines, hence acidification, as well as reduce carbonate ions and increase bicarbonate. So this, this decline in carbonate ion is potentially important for calcification, such as occurs in corals. That you have carbonate ions which react with calcium to form solid calcium carbonate, uh, composed of skeleton many organisms. And based on inorganic uh, precipitation rates, uh, the expected response of calcification would be something like that. We have a dramatic decline in calcification rates as CO2 levels rise. But in most calcifiers, such as corals, uh, you aren't actually calcifying directly from seawater. Here you see the surface of a coral, individual polyps, a few millimeters across. In cross section, looks something like this. We have a skeleton underneath, tissue layer, and then there's seawater outside. Blowing this up further, we see that we have a total of four tissue layers separating this outer environment where we are having this rise in CO2 decline in carbonate ion concentration, and this site where calcification actually occurs. So it isn't necessarily certain that the change out here is going to correspond to so dramatic change here. And if we look at a range of studies which have looked at uh, calcification rates as a function of carbonate ion, we get a pattern something like this. Yes, there is a general decline in calcification as the carbonate ion in the outside environment decreases. But there's also a lot of scatter. That some studies where they're seeing essentially no change in calcification, others show dissolution at the same external carbonate ion concentration. One possible reason for this is that, yes, we do have these dramatic changes in carbon chemistry, declines in carbonate ion out here. But in this internal environment, we know for, for one, they regulate pH to some degree. They increase the pH of this internal calcifying environment. And the effect of increasing pH is shown here. That as you increase pH at a given uh, carbon concentration, you're going to increase the carbonate ion concentration and in theory, increase calcification rates. So if they're able to maintain a given pH in that internal environment, it really doesn't matter what the external environment does. And it's really a question of to what degree are they able to regulate that internal pH uh, in response to these changes in the external environment. And certainly, they are able to upregulate under a wide range of external CO2 conditions. But clearly, there are variations in how calcification responds. So the question is, how variable is this pH regulation in corals? And to investigate this, what we've done is we have used a couple different techniques. Uh, one, which was done at, uh, by the Monica Group, was using in situ measurements of pH using a fluorescent indicator, SNARF. And then what we've done is looking at the same specimens, looking at boron isotope composition. And we've done these measurements in different parts of the uh, skeleton or calcified environment with in vitro measurements. We've also measured growth rates in different regions of the coral. And what I will be showing you is that in those regions where you have the largest changes in the pH of that calcifying fluid, you also have the largest changes in calcification rate. So where, they're most, where pH is most affected by changes in the pH of the external environment, calcification is also most affected. So what we're working on are uh, Slava pistolata. Uh, we take uh, branch tips about one centimeter in height, attach them to glass slides, and then these are grown under a range of CO2 conditions. 
uh, ranging from present day, twice, five times, to approximately 10 times present day atmospheric CO2. For the confocal microscopy measurements, for the N, uh, C2 pH measurements, why we're looking at a very small region at the growing edge of the coral. So where the uh, skeleton is just starting to form underneath the coral tissue. And these are measured in flowing seawater on a confocal microscopy stage. And then measurements are made by looking up underneath th through the glass slide into the coral tissue. And this is, uh, here you can see, looking down on one of the coral uh, nubbins which we do measurements on. Looking up from underneath, this is what uh, the uh, tissue looks like. We have seawater out here, and then this is the start of the coral tissue. And then we get to higher magnification, we see that we have some crystal bundles, and then there's the overlying tissue. Below, we're introducing a fluorescent probe, and it, uh, with this probe, why the tissue layer is this fluorescent uh, yellow, and then there are these areas that have more of a reddish color, which are actually spaces underneath that tissue uh, adjacent to the glass slide, and you also have crystals in that space. And the pH measurements are done in these spaces in between that calcifying tissue and the glass slide on which the coral is growing, adjacent to the calcium carbonate crystals. The other technique that we've employed is based on the Bohr isotope pH proxy. That in seawater, uh, we have boron, which exists as two species. There's boric acid and borate, which are in equilibrium. And percentage present as borate for boric acid depends strongly on pH. Here we can see the uh, percentage of these species as a function of pH. And as we increase pH, we increase the percentage in borate. And borate is incorporated into aragonite. So that in of itself uh, provides a potential mechanism. But even more important is that there is a isotopic difference between borate and boric acid. There are two isotopes of boron, 10 and 11. Uh, by convention, we express these as delta values, which is just a means of expressing the ratio of boron 11 to boron 10. And these are in isotopic equilibrium with, and the, there's a dramatic difference between the borate, the uh, boric acid, and the borate. We have about a 27 per mil difference between borate and boric acid. Thus, if we can measure just the isotopic composition of borate, we can then calculate a pH value. And since borate's incorporated in the coral skeleton, by measuring the, the isotopic composition of the boron in the coral skeleton, we can get an estimate of the pH under which that aragonite formed. So in these skeletons, we have done uh, boron isotope measurements on the apical portion of the growth, as well as the lateral growth on the glass slide. And then there are also the uh, confocal microscopy measurements made out here at the growing edge. Here are the pH values. They're measured by each of these techniques, plot against the external sea water pH. And this dotted line represents the one-to-one -one relationship, which would be expected if the internal pH were that of seawater. So we can see that no matter where we've measured, the pH values are elevated relative to the external seawater. And the degree of elevation increases as the external seawater pH declines. So thus, the corals are maintaining a much more stable pH in that internal calcified environment than is experienced by the external seawater. Further, we have differences between different regions of the coral skeleton. That, that apical growth has a shallower slope, a smaller change in internal pH with acidification, whereas both the uh, lateral growth and the measures done at the growing edge exhibit a much steeper response. We also measure calcification in the lateral growing region, just looking at the expansion of the coral across that glass slide, as well as measuring the vertical growth of the apex. And so here we have relative growth 
uh, against pH. And the lateral growth shows a decline in calcification. And we have significantly lower calcification rates at pH is 7.1 relative to ambient, whereas the apical growth shows no effect of acidification. So what we see here is that we have apical growth, which is showing no response to acidification in its uh, growth rate. Similarly, we have a much sourer, much less response in the internal pH. It's maintaining a much more stable internal pH relative to what's happening at the growing edge or in the lateral growth. And that lateral growth is showing a decline in calcification rate. It's also showing a much stronger decline in the pH, the calci calcifying environment. So this suggests that the regions where we have the strongest changes in the internal pH, that calcifying fluid, is also the regions where we're going to have the strongest effects of acidification on calcification. And the differences in how corals are able to regulate their internal pH, either between species or even within regions of a given coral, are going to have dramatic in, uh, dramatically influence the response of the coral and how calcification will change in response to acidification. And particularly if the results we have for Stoffer are applicable to the range of species, which I imagine they are, growth over new surfaces such as colonization of substrate, larval growth, are steps that are likely to be most sensitive to acidification. So those are the regions that are likely to be most strongly affected and have the least ability to regulate their internal pH. Thank you. Mm -hmm.